Lux presents Hollywood. Lever Brothers Company, the makers of Lux Toilet Soap, bring you the Lux Radio Theater, starring Barbara Stanwyck and Burt Lancaster in Sorry, Wrong Number. Ladies and gentlemen, your producer, Mr. William Keeley. Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. Tonight's play reverses the usual relation between radio and motion pictures. Sorry, Wrong Number was first a radio drama, and it achieved such success on the air that Hal Wallace decided to make a picture of it. He assigned the author, Lucille Fletcher, to expand her short drama into a full-length screenplay, and the result was a triumph of suspense drama. The rest of the success story you know, because the Paramount picture with Barbara Stanwyck and Burt Lancaster as the stars was one of the top films of the year. Tonight, Sorry Wrong Number completes the circle and comes back to radio with Miss Stanwyck and Mr. Lancaster in their original screen roles. Just as our drama had a double success story, so has our product, Lux Toilet Soap. It's been a favorite for years in the regular size, and now the new bath size has made Lux Soap a hit all over again. The curtain rises now for the first act of Sorry, Wrong Number, starring Barbara Stanwyck as Leona and Bert Lancaster as Henry. <laughs> In the tangled network of a great city, the telephone is the unseen link between a million lives, servant of our common needs, confident of our inmost secrets. Life and happiness wait upon its ring, and horror and loneliness, and sometimes even death. Operator. 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 Your call, please. Operator, I've been ringing Murray Hill 32491 for the last half hour, and the line is always busy. Will you ring it for me, please? Murray Hill 32491. One moment, please. It's my husband's office. He should have been home hours ago. I can't think why that ridiculous wire should be busy. They always close that office at 6 o'clock. I am ringing your number. Thank you. Oh, it's busy again. Operator, the line is busy. Now, will you please... Hello? Hello, Mrs. Stevenson, please. Hello? I want to speak to Mr. Henry Stevenson. Hello, George. Speaking. Hello, what number is this? Everything okay for tonight, George? Client says the coast is clear. I beg your pardon, but I'm using this wire. What about the time? Still 11.15? 11.15. You got it all straight now? Hello? Yeah, I think it's 11 o'clock. The private patrolman goes around to the bar on 2nd Avenue for a beer. Then I get in through the kitchen window. I wait until the train goes over the bridge in case her window is open and she should scream. Who is this? Hello? Client says he doesn't want her to suffer long. You know me, George. And don't forget the jewelry. He wants it to look like a robbery, see? That's very important. Okay. Now, let me check the... Hello! Hello! Oh, that's awful. That, that's horrible. Operator. Operator, you... You just gave me a wrong number. I was calling Murray Hill 32491. But instead, I was cut into some other number that you dialed. The wires must have been crossed or something, and I, I i just heard the most dreadful thing, a murder. Yes, madam. I want you to get that wrong number back for me at once. I'm sorry, madam. I do not understand. I just told you. You dialed a number for me. And then those those horrible men came on, and, well, it, it, it unnerved me dreadfully. I'm an invalid, I'll and I... I'll connect you with the chief operator, madam. Well, do something, please. Chief operator, may I help you? What? Oh, oh, yes. Yes, you may. I'm an invalid, and I've just had a dreadful shock just now on this telephone, and I'm very anxious to trace the call. It was about a murder, a terrible, cold-blooded murder of a poor, innocent woman tonight at 11.15. Yes, madam. I was trying to reach my husband's office. He should have been home hours ago. It's almost 10 o'clock. I'm all alone tonight. My nurse has the night off because my husband promised he'd be home by six. About the call, madam. I don't know any of the neighbors as we live permanently in Chicago, and it it, it so happens that the couple I have working for me had some important date or other. I, I don't know, a movie, I suppose. They they said it was promised them three weeks ago. You'd think they'd at least have checked with me before leaving. They, they know I'm not well. About the phone call, madam. I told you. I kept getting a busy signal. Then I asked the operator to call for me. And then... Out of a clear sky, I was cut into this ghastly conversation between two killers. I suggest you call the police, madam. Oh, for heaven's sake, all this idiotic red tape. You just sit there and let people die. Oh. Is is 
anyone downstairs? Gertrude. Gertrude, are you down there? Oh. Oh, oh. 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 Operator. Give me the police. I just told you, ma'am. First of all, there's a lot of people named George. As for the private patrolman and 2nd Avenue and the bridge, well, 2nd Avenue is a very long street. I don't care about... Do you happen to know how many bridges there are in Manhattan? Oh, this is insane. I tell you, a woman is going to be murdered. But a clue of this sort, why, it's not much more use to us than no clue at all. Unless you think there's something phony about all this. Phony? Or that somebody's trying to murder you. Me? Oh, that would be ridiculous. I mean... Why should anybody? What have I... Ah, you see, lady, you got nothing to worry about. Now, just a minute. All right, don't listen to me. Who cares? Oh, Henry, why did you leave me alone? Why did you leave me alone here? Uh... Oh, his secretary. Henry's secretary, she'd know. Her number's on the pad. Jennings. Miss Jennings, Elizabeth Jennings. He was supposed to be home hours ago. Well, that's odd, isn't it? The last time I saw him was when he left this afternoon to keep an appointment. What appointment? Where? Well, I... I don't know, but I do know he had a luncheon date with a young lady. What young lady? Tell me, Miss Jennings. Oh, uh, Mrs. Lord. Mrs. Frederick Lord. She seemed very anxious to see Mr. Stevens. Mrs. Lord? I heard him make a date to meet her for lunch. Why, Mrs. Lord phoned here this afternoon. Oh? Yes, the nurse answered. I have the memorandum right here. Mrs. Lord, 4.50 p.m. I'm afraid that's all I know, Mrs. Stevenson. But I'm sure it's nothing to worry about. Mr. Stevenson's so devoted. He speaks so beautifully of you. Well, if there's anything I can No, do... no, thank you, Miss Jennings. I do hope I haven't let a cat out of the bag. Good night, Miss Jennings. Mrs. Lord, a young lady, she said. Lunch and gone all afternoon. Hello? Mr. Stevenson, please. He's not in. Who's calling? It's... Mr. Evans again. Do you know where I could reach him? I'm sure I don't know where Mr. Stevenson is. Call back later. Would 15 minutes be all right? I haven't much time. Yes, 15 minutes. And if he should come in, the name is Evans. It's very important. Yes, yes, I'll tell him. Mrs. Lord Telephone, 4.50 p.m. Murray Hill, 3, 9266. Hello? Is Mrs. Lord in? This is Mrs. Lord. Who's calling, please? Mrs. Henry Stevenson. It so happens my husband hasn't come home this evening. I thought perhaps you might give me some idea as yes, to where... Yes, yes, but I can't talk now. I can't hear you. Could I call you back? Call me back? Why? Is anything wrong? Leona, this is Sally. Sally Hunt. Sally Hunt? I'm sorry if I sound ridiculous, but I can't talk now. No, 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 wait. If you're the Sally Hunt I used to I'll know... I'll call you back as soon as I can, Leona. Sally, who was it? Uh, just uh, one of the girls, dear. She she wanted a recipe. Hey, Joe, I'd like a bottle of beer. You got any on ice? Oh, no, I'm afraid not. I'll run down to the store. Thanks, honey. And hurry back. Joe is dying. Sally. Sally Hunt. Oh, yes. Yes, that was long ago. College, spring dance. He was Sally's date. He was with her when I met him. Henry. Henry dancing with Sally. Hello, Leona. This, uh, this is Mr. Henry Stevens. Hello, Henry. Well, can I cut in? If you don't mind, miss, where I come from, it's the man who does the picture. All right, go ahead. But why don't you get somebody your own speed? I'm sure there are better dancers around. Oh, you'll do all right, Henry. Leona knows her way around the floor. Thank you, darling. Well, Henry, let's dance. Your name's Cuttle, huh? No relation to, uh, J.B. Cuttle. Distant. He's my father. Your father? Anything wrong with that? Oh, no, no, nothing wrong. What do they call you? The aspirin era? <laughs> you from out of town? Well, that depends on what you call out of town. Oh, I don't know. Carvin? I'm trying to be funny. Okay. What do you call out of town? Oh, Grassville. Oh. What college is up there? No college, Miss Cuttle. Just factories. I never even finished high school. Neither did my father. He always says if a man has talent for making money, why should he waste his time in school? I guess your old man ought to know. What do you say we sit the next dance out? Why? I've got a car, Mr. Stevenson, a brand new one, a Lagonda. Ever drive one? I never even heard of one. 
Besides, I'm with Sally. Oh, don't worry. She'll never miss you. But maybe I'll miss her. Or didn't you think of that? Oh, come on. Don't be silly. For once, I'm not kidding. And neither am I. So long, Miss Cotterell. Well, Henry, it took me a few days, but I finally got you in my car. How do you like it? Fine. Only we don't go together. It's a lot easier to see you here than, well, with Sally Hunt. I've never put the two of you together in a million years. Why not? Oh, you're both so different. You, uh, you belong in different worlds. Yeah. What are you stopping for? Why not? It's nice here. Sure, it's nice here. Take a look. This is Grassville. Stick around a few years and then see how much you'll like it. What do you do, Henry? I work in a drugstore. Well, that's a coincidence. Sure. I work in a drugstore, and your father owns a hundred of them. Would you like to meet him? Say, who are you kidding? Nobody. Dad will like you. You're young, healthy, ambitious. Why don't you stop? What does a girl like you want with a guy like me? Dad's coming to New York next weekend. I'm cutting my classes on Saturday. Want to come with me? I don't know. When you look at me like that, I... Come on, let's get out of here. No, not yet, Henry. Not yet, darling. Sure, sure, I like him, honey, but he's nobody, Leona. And what has he got? Nothing. And what did you have, Dad, when you started? Besides, I thought you said he was sort of engaged to that girlfriend of yours, that Sally something. Oh, like. that's all over with. Dad, I... I love him. Love him? Oh, come on. If I really thought you did, you know I'd be oh, the first no. one. Oh, no. Don't start telling me that. Leona, what's the matter? You make me laugh. What does it really matter to you if I love Henry or not? All you want is for me to stay here with you for the rest of your life. You're afraid of losing me. Haven't I always let you do anything you ever wanted to do? But marriage is something else. I, I've worked hard. I, I built up a big business just for you. And you yourself wouldn't want to see some worthless clock of a husband, a guy who let doesn't... Let me even... alone. Leona, You don't please. care about me. You're thinking only of yourself and your business. You're hateful, selfish, and hateful. Leona, stop it, dear. You'll make yourself sick And what again. good is your wonderful money and your wonderful business if I'm dead? Yes, that's what you want to do. Drive me into my grave. You don't care just as long as your business is safe. How can you say things oh, like that? Oh, go away. Don't touch me. Don't you dare touch me. Darling, listen to me. I oh. don't mean to... Oh. Look, we'll talk it all over oh. again as soon as... Oh. Leona... Wilson! Wilson, quick, call a doctor! Sally. Sally Hunt. <laughs> I took Henry away from her. She couldn't stand it. Even after all these years, she couldn't stand it. Going to him today, seeing him in his office. Hello? Leona, this is Sally again. I'm sorry I had to be so mysterious before, but I just couldn't talk at home. My husband... Well, this is all certainly rather odd, to say the least. Oh, this whole thing must seem very peculiar to you, Leona. Hearing from me after all these years. But I had to see Henry again today. I've been so worried about him. Worried? About what? Well, my... my husband. He's with the district attorney's office. And a couple of weeks ago... Something funny, Sally. Here in the newspaper about an old boyfriend of yours. Old boyfriend? Yeah. Remember Henry Stevenson? Oh. Pictures in the paper. Mr. and Mrs. Henry Stevenson, she's the former Leona Cotterill of Lake Forest, Illinois, have taken a house for the summer in Sutton Place. Mrs. Stevenson, in poor health for several years, is here to consult with specialists. Mr. Stevenson is vice president of the Cotterill Drug Corporation. Are you tearing it out for me? Oh, no. No, it may come in handy in a case I'm working on. What sort of a case? Oh, special investigation. Joe's on it, wouldn't he? Henry hasn't done anything wrong, has he? Sorry, honey. One too many questions. Eh? Don't tell me you're still stuck on that guy. Oh, don't be silly, darling. Hello. Anything happened, Joe? And Stevenson fell for it, huh? Oh, sure, we'll go. Look, tell Bolger to line it up. Tell oh, 5000 is enough and $100 bills and make sure they're marked. And for Pete's sake, keep your mouth shut. Thursday, huh? Okay, 10 o'clock. I'm sorry if it seems involved, the young Involved? I simply don't know what you're trying to tell me. Well, wait till I finish. I know I didn't have any right to do it. But that Thursday, I went to South Derry. I don't know what I expected to see, but... Well, anyway, I spotted Fred and his friend Joe from the police. There was another man with them. I guess the one who was to bring the $5,000 in Mark bills. Well, I... I followed them. Followed them where? Aboard the ferry and over to Staten Island. They went far out to a very desolated stretch of beach. Nothing but a few broken-down shacks and an old deserted house. 
I had to stay way behind them so they wouldn't see me. But then they went in the house. That gave me a chance to come closer. There was a freshly painted sign out front. 20 Dunstan Terrace, it said. And the name Evans. W. Evans. Evans? Do you know him? I... No, I've never heard of him. Well, what happened? Well, after a while, a motorboat came into shore and tied up at a pier in back of a house. A man, sort of elderly, got out of the boat and went into the house. He was carrying a suitcase. A little later, my husband came out. Only now he had the suitcase. Well, he didn't come home until late that night. Now, I was dying to ask him what happened, what possible connection it could have with Henry. Well? I... I didn't dare ask him, Leona. But things have happened since, and unless we do something, something drastic, it may be too late. Your five minutes are up. Please deposit five cents for the next five minutes. Oh, just a minute, please. I, I know I have another nickel. Are you still there, Leona? I'm here. This is one of the queerest things I've ever heard. Yes, I know. And I just didn't seem to be able to connect Henry with it. That's why I finally went to see him today. What did you find out? Well, I met him for lunch. He told the captain he was expecting a very important phone call, and then we sat down. It's been a long time, Sally. Eight years. Tell me, how's dear old Grassville these days? I don't know, Henry. I haven't been back. So you're married now, hmm? Living here in New York? Yes. My husband's with the district attorney's office. Oh? That's why I wanted... Henry, what I... But what I'm trying to say is this. A few days ago, I saw a picture of you in the newspaper. Vice President now. Sounds beautiful, doesn't it? Biggest drug business in the country. I was sorry to read that Leona isn't well. Yes. Chicago doctors don't seem to know just what it is. Her trouble, I mean. Henry, what do you do in the drug business? Push buttons, like all other vice presidents. Oh, but I'm serious. So am I. I'm almost as important as the office boy. <sighs> don't mean to be inquisitive. I only need this for your own good. You mean what for my own good? Well, yesterday my husband was making out a report. We have your phone call, Mr. Stevens. Oh, thanks. Excuse me, Sally. I'll be right back. Well, I waited a while, Leona. But Henry didn't come back, Please and then I... deposit five cents for the next five minutes. Operator, but I haven't been talking five minutes. I deposited another nickel only a couple... I am sorry, madam. Please deposit another five cents. But I haven't any more change. Hello? Hello? Leona, I'll have to call you back. But I only wanted to say that Henry never came back to the table and that he is in trouble. Fred's been talking to the police. I've heard him mention Henry's name over and over again. And there's someone else in it, too. That man called Evans. Your five minutes are up, madam. Waldo Evans. He owns that house on Staten Island. I am sorry, madam. I will have to disconnect you. Reverse the charge and put them on this phone. Operator! Operator! <laughs> We'll bring you act two of Sorry, Wrong Number. Now, here's Libby Collins, our Hollywood reporter. Well, Libby, that was a gala evening we all had at the premiere of 20th Century Fox's new picture, 12 O'Clock High. Yes, indeed. And for one person in particular, it must have been the thrill of a lifetime. I'm thinking about our little Lux girl, Jackie Barnes. The winner of the national contest for the prettiest 15-year-old Lux girl. Mm-hmm. Jackie was an honored guest at the premiere. She certainly was a radiant youngster. She got more compliments than she could count that evening. Well, that's the way it is with Lux girls, Libby. You know, Jackie was telling me how impressed she was with 12 O'Clock High. As everyone was. It's always good news when Gregory Peck heads a cast. And this time, I think he has the best role of his career. Yes, he makes the tough commander of a wartime bomber group an unforgettable personality. It's a gripping story you feel intensely. The dangerous flying sequences, the day-by-day -day strain those men endured. The whole cast is magnificent. Twelve o'clock high is one picture, Libby, where the men take the honors. Yes, except for Joyce McKenzie. She plays the one feminine role. Makes her debut in pictures as the army nurse. Mm, there's another lovely Lux girl. She is indeed, John. Like so many successful young actresses, she finds Lux toilet soap gives her complexion just the care it needs. Recent tests by skin specialists prove that Lux soap care really works. In actually three out of four cases... Skin became softer, smoother in a short time. No wonder Lux Toilet Soap is the leading beauty soap, not only in Hollywood, but all over the country. If you haven't tried it, why not begin your Lux Soap facials tomorrow? Remember, nine out of ten screen stars recommend this gentle protecting care. Now, our producer, Mr. William Keeley. Act two of Sorry, Wrong Number, starring Barbara Stanwyck as Leona and Burt Lancaster as Henry. It's a moment or so later. Through an open window, the night air drifts slowly in Leona's window. 
heavy with the heat of a New York summer. The owner lies motionless on the bed, and the sounds of the night become magnified. The tugboats on the river, the hum of distant traffic, the muffled roar of a train passing over a bridge, and then suddenly... Hello? Leona, this is Sally again. Can you hear me? I can hear you. I'm calling from the subway station. The stores around here are all closed. I've just been home, Leona, and some more has happened. That house on Staten Island, the one I told you about, well, it was burned down this afternoon. The police have captured three men, but this Waldo Evans escaped. But who is Waldo Evans? And for heaven's sake, what's his connection with my husband? I still don't know, Leona, but I do know the whole thing has something to do with your father's company. Oh, that's absurd. My father called me from Chicago this afternoon. He never mentioned a word. Now, look, who's been arrested and why? Three men, and I don't know why. And why do you think Henry's one of them? I didn't say that. Did anyone say he was going to be arrested? No, not exactly. Then what are you talking about? Why are you calling me like this? Are you still jealous that I took Henry away from you? Can't you bear to see me happy? Can't you stop telling lies and making trouble even now? Leona, I can't talk anymore. Then I'm right. You are just trying to make trouble. No, no. Fred and Joe, they're coming down the subway platform. If my husband should see me here... Leona, I've got to hang up. Hello? Oh. Yes? This is Western Union. We have a message for Mrs. Henry Stevenson. This is Mrs. Stevenson. The telegram is as follows. Darling, terribly sorry, but last minute remembered annual drug convention tomorrow in Boston. Taking next train out, back Sunday morning. Oh. Keep well. All my love. Oh. And signed, Henry. That is all, madam. Do you wish us to deliver a copy of the... Oh. Oh, no. Then I wait till the train goes over the bridge in case your window is open and she should scream. Oh. Fire says the coast is clear. Oh. I got your message, George. Everything okay for tonight? Henry's in trouble. Death for trouble. No, I'm terribly sorry. Take the next no. train up. Next to the point. Then I wait till the train goes over the bridge. Oh. Then I wait till the train goes over the bridge. Oh, yes, Mrs. Stevenson. How are you? I need you right away, Doctor. Please, come right over. Now, now, Mrs. Stevenson, what seems to be the I matter? said I want you to come over at once. I'm afraid I can't tonight, Mrs. Stevenson. Now, be sensible. If you just make up your mind to cooperate with your husband and me in our plan of action... Plan of I... action? What are you talking about? Mrs. Stevenson, I explained everything in my letter over a week ago. Letter? What letter? But surely your husband... Hasn't he spoken to you, Mrs. Stevenson? About what? Look, you... You try to compose yourself now, and perhaps we can discuss it tomorrow. We'll discuss it now. Do you hear me? Now, this very minute. Well, if you insist upon knowing, your husband called at my office about ten days ago. He seemed quite concerned about your condition, naturally. Anyway, we discussed your illness at great length. Still a puzzle with me, Doctor. I still don't know what's wrong with her. Well, Mr. Stevenson... Your wife's illness seems to date far back to her early childhood. Is that true? Yes, I suppose so. But you knew nothing about it when you married her? No, not till after a couple of years. You see, we were we were living with her father then in Lake Forest. I remember early one morning. Why did you do that, Henry? Why did you send the maid for my handbag? Why? Because there's something in it that I need. Well, how much money do you want? I'm sorry to disappoint you, Leona, but this time it isn't money. It's simply that I wrote Ferguson's telephone number in your notebook last night. I want to call him. We have a date for lunch. You know perfectly well you're having lunch with me today. I, I know, Leona, but, but I won't be able to make it. This date with Ferguson's rather important. Oh? More important than me, I suppose? Oh, it isn't that, Leona. It's just that... Well, it's about a job. You have a job. What on earth are you talking about? Leona. Leona, I've been meaning to say this for you, to you for weeks. I just don't belong in your father's business. Who says you don't? I do. I say it. Working for your father is like, like running in a dream. No matter how hard you try, you know you'll never get anywhere. I don't want to graft off your charity for the rest of my life. I want a chance. A chance on my own. Only you're not getting the chance. I won't have you traipsing around, you hear? Just because Dad doesn't go falling all over himself, you're not going to throw away a million-dollar business like Cotterell for an idle whim. It happens to be my business, too, you know. And to think my own husband turns up his nose at it. Now call Ferguson and tell him you've changed your mind. Go on, Henry, call him. But I haven't changed my mind. You're still going? Yes. Someday you'll see it'll be better for both of us. Henry! Henry, wait! 
Now, that's a little silly, isn't it, locking the door? You're not going, Henry. Not as long as you're my husband. Oh, come on, Leona, give me that you key. You can't do it. You can't do this to me. Nobody's ever done it. Nobody, nobody. Will you please stop and give me that Henry, key? Henry, please. If you love me, if you love me at all. Henry, I, I beg you. I'll talk to Dad. I'll do anything. Anything you want, only don't leave me. Don't go away. Give me that key. No, no, I won't. I won't. I won't. Oh, oh, Henry, you're hurting me. Your husband told me, Mrs. Stevenson, that in spite of your opposition, he had lunch that day with Mr. Ferguson. When he got home that evening, he said your father was waiting for him at the door, angry and worried. All right, Henry. Come in the library. I want to talk to you. What's the matter? Where's Leona? Leona's in bed. She had an attack. A heart attack. She almost died. Heart attack? Did you two quarrel this morning? Yes, but... But what's that Weren't got... you supposed to have lunch with Leona? Yes, but I had to see someone else. Look, Mr. Carter, if you don't mind, I'd like to see Leona. You'll see Leona when she's ready to see you. Just in case you don't know it, Leona's had a heart condition since childhood. Her mother died of it the day Leona was born. Leona can't stand being treated the way you did this morning. She never has been before, and she's not going to be now by you or anyone else. And what happens if once in a while I have an opinion of my own? I don't give a hoot about your opinions, Henry. Have them. Think anything you like. But while you're in this house, you'll do what my daughter tells you to do. I think you should know that the argument this morning was about a very important decision. Don't be a fool. A decision I made as much for the sake of Leona's future as for my own. Was it for her that you had lunch with Ferguson? Well, did you get the job? No. No, I didn't. And I'll tell you why you didn't. It so happens I'm a pretty good customer of Ferguson's. I buy more than $2 million worth of dyes every year. Now, who do you think he's going to care about, you or me? So that's what happened. Now, who else in Chicago would you like to have lunch with about a job? Oh, face up to it, Henry. Just as long as you're my son-in-law, you're working for me and nobody else. If you really cared for Leona the way I do, you'd have done the same thing in my place. Besides, you haven't done so badly for yourself. Now, go upstairs and see Leona. She's been asking for you. Well, Mrs. Stevenson, as I say, we discussed all these things in my office ten days ago, your husband and I. I asked Mr. Stevenson how long this heart attack of yours lasted. Oh, she got well right away, Doctor. Maybe I... Maybe I should have pulled out then and there. But I didn't pull out. Somehow I couldn't. Her father wasn't altogether wrong. I hadn't done too badly for myself. Anyway, from that time on, I began to compromise. Always with the hope that Somehow, someday, I'd win out on my own. But it wasn't long before we were right back where we started. Another attack? Yes, sir. I remember one day in particular. I had an idea that I thought, that I hoped might help the situation. Henry, you mean you brought me here just to look at an apartment? Oh, you'd be crazy about it, Leona. Now, come on, let's go in and look it over. I'm not interested, Henry. But you haven't even seen it. Why, there are terraces on all four sides. I've told you a thousand times we don't need an apartment. Leona. Leona, it's not an apartment I'm looking for. What I want is a home. A home of our own. You just can't go on living with your father indefinitely. I don't see why not. There's plenty of room and I like it. Besides, who's going to pay for this little penthouse? Well, I hope eventually I will. Oh, eventually. But in the meantime, it's my money and I'm the one who's going to pay for it. Okay, Leona. Let's go. Oh, Henry, you're so naive. You're like a little boy with a box of candy. I just can't throw my money away on everything you happen to see. There's a limit. Sure, there's a limit. I'm supposed to follow you around like a pet dog tied to a chain. I'm supposed to like whatever crumbs you want to throw. Oh, don't be ridiculous. Yes, you've got me sewed up 16 different ways for three meals a day and pocket money. That's all you care about. That's all you married me for, my money. I should have known it. I should have known oh, it. Oh, stop it, Leona. Please, just for once, will you listen to you me? You hate me. You're bored with me. All you want to do is get away. Okay, I'm bored. Bored stiff. Who oh. wouldn't be with that neat little routine you've got cooked up for me? What do I have? Nothing. Nothing on my own. Not even the studs on my shirt or the matches in my Henry, pocket. Henry, how can you say this to me? You once told me I'd love this kind of life, remember? Well, do you want to know something? I do love it. I love it now more than you'll ever know. But I want to be my own boss, profiting by every bit of it. Not just the uh, stooge on the outside looking uh, in. Henry! Henry, get me some water. Quick! Listen to me, Leona. Please. Oh. It isn't that I want to be without you. I could love oh. you still if only you try to understand. Henry, my purse. Henry, the, the pill in my purse. That attack kept her in the hospital nearly three weeks, Doctor. At the time, I... Well, I thought it was all my fault. But no matter what I did, her attacks increased in violence and became more frequent. About a year ago, Leona... Well, she, she just seemed to give up hope of ever getting well. She took to her bed more or less permanently. 
It was my idea to come to New York and see you. The doctors in Chicago said she didn't have much of a chance. Anyway, we rented the house on Sutton Place, and here we are. Believe me, it's been more and more like a nightmare. Mr. Stevenson, there's absolutely nothing wrong organically with your wife's heart. Nothing wrong? I've examined her thoroughly. And what you've just told me confirms what I've thought from the start. And, and that is? Her condition is mostly mental. Mental? She's what we call a cardiac neurotic. Her attacks are brought on by her emotions, her lack of control, her frustrations. The whole thing is probably quite unconscious on her part. Now, I'm not saying your wife isn't sick. Mentally, she is sick, and her attacks are real enough. But given the proper treatment, she may snap out of it entirely. Well, I'll... I'll call on her tomorrow. There's a psychiatrist I wanted to see. Doctor, I, I wish you could wait a few days. I'd like to think this over. Think it over? Yes, you see, she's so easily upset. I think that, well, that maybe I ought to prepare her. You know, get her used to the idea. Well, a few days more or less won't matter, I suppose. Unless, unless you wanted to write her a letter. It might make it easier for her to take, and it, well, it would give me more time to talk to her. Well, it's an extremely delicate matter, Mr. Stevenson. But if you think you can manage it, let's try it that way. Give me a ring in a couple of days. Meanwhile, I'll write the letter. Thanks, Doctor. Thanks for everything. Well, that's exactly the way I left things, Mrs. Stevenson, ten days ago. As your husband requested, I wrote you the letter. And I'm telling you I never received a letter. Well, let's not worry about that now. I've told you everything, and now I want you to relax. Do you have that sedative I prescribed? Yes, yes, it's here. Well, then take some. Double the dose and I'll... Liars! 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 <laughs> Hello! Mrs. Stevenson? Who is it? This is Mr. Evans. I've been trying to get you, but your line has been busy. Has Mr. Stevenson come home? No, no, he isn't here. He won't be back until Sunday. And will you please, please tell me what this is all about? Why are you calling him? Who are you? I've already told you, Mrs. Stevenson, and I'm very sorry if I've annoyed you. But there are names and addresses that are very important for Mr. Stevenson to know. So if you'll be good enough to take the following message... What are you talking about? I can't take any messages now. If you'll please tell Mr. Stevenson that the house at 20 Dunstan Terrace has been burned down. I burned it down. You... you what? Also, that I do not believe it was Mr. Morano... The name is spelled M-O-R-A-N-O, who betrayed us to the police. And since Mr. Morano has been arrested by the district attorney's office, there is no necessity for the money. Oh, Oh, this is fantastic. What money? Who's Morano? Thirdly, tell Mr. Stevenson that I escaped, and I am now at the Manhattan address. However, I do not expect to be here after midnight. If he wishes to find me, he may call me at a phone number, Bowie 21000. And now... If you'll be so good as to repeat... Oh, you're insane. Do you realize I'm a terribly sick woman? I'm very sorry for you, Mrs. Stevenson. I don't know. Perhaps it would be better to tell you the true facts. I mean now, before they are garbled by the police. Maybe then you'll understand. But if you're... I don't know what or whom to believe. So much has happened to me tonight. And I'm sick. My doctor says I... I'll tell you all I know, Mrs. Stevenson. Well, tell me then. Tell me. It started over a little... A year ago. At your father's factory in Chicago. You see, Mrs. Stevenson, I had worked in your father's company for many years. I'm a chemist. Anyway, late one afternoon, your husband walked into the laboratory. We pause now for station identification. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. In a few moments, we'll continue with Act Three of Sorry, Wrong Number. Our guest tonight is Barbara Ann Newton, young Par- Paramount starlet. Aren't you glad, Barbara, you were present at a certain little theater production one evening? A lucky evening for me, Mr. Keeley. A talent scout saw me, arranged for a screen test. And, and here you are in picture. Yes. And from now on, I'm going to work like mad. Oh, it must be wonderful to be a great actress like, like Olivia de Havilland. Well, I gather you've seen her new picture, The Heiress. Not once, but three times. 
I can understand why the New York motion picture critics gave Mr. Havlin the award for the best performance of the year. And how did you like Montgomery Clift as the money-conscious suitor in the heiress? He's splendid, so dashing and, and romantic, too. And Ralph Richardson as a stern father is simply perfect. Do you remember the scene where he compares his unpopular daughter with her sought-after cousin? Oh, yes. The party scene where Mona Freeman is the reigning belle. She's like a Dresden doll. So blonde and dainty. Those lavish costumes of the crinoline era suit her beauty very well. Yes, Mr. Kennedy. And she's just as delicate and lovely in real life. Always so beautifully groomed. Real luxe loveliness, huh? Exactly. Mona Freeman gives her complexion daily luxe soap care. And she's really keen about the new bath size cake. Nine out of ten screen stars say they're delighted with this new product of Lever Brothers Company. For a luxurious, refreshing, relaxing beauty bath, you simply can't buy a finer soap. That's the way I feel. I love the nice fragrance it leaves on the skin. Thank you, Miss Barbara Ann Knudsen. Women who use the generous new bath size Lux Toilet Soap will agree. Its rich, abundant lather and delicate flower-like fragrance make a wonderfully refreshing beauty bath. So, for all over Lux loveliness, why not get the satin smooth bath size Lux Toilet Soap tomorrow? Here's our producer, Mr. William Keeley. The curtain rises on the third act of Sorry, Wrong Number, starring Barbara Stanwyck as Leona and Bert Lancaster as Henry. clock on the table says ten minutes to eleven o'clock, but Leona Stevenson, clutching the telephone, listens with mounting bewilderment and fright to the voice of a man named Waldo Evans. Yes, Mrs. Stevenson, your husband came into the laboratory and started asking me questions about the drugs we use and how we prepare them. Well, this is very interesting, Mr. Evans. So, uh, this is where the formula for all our products are developed, huh? That's right. Some of these drugs must be very valuable. Oh, yes, Mr. Stevenson, very valuable. And uh, tell me, uh, what do you do with them? Why, they go into the various Cotterell products, sir. Mm-hmm. And uh, you're the man in charge here, huh? Yes, sir. I see. Well, thanks for your time, Mr. Evans. I was just curious. Thank you, sir. Good night, Mr. Stevenson. That was my first meeting with your husband, Mrs. Stevenson. Then... From time to time, he'd drop into the laboratory and visit with me. And one night, when it was storming, he offered to drive me home. So you're a bachelor, Mr. Evans. Well, I didn't know that. Yes, sir. I live in a looming house on uh, Chestnut Street. A man all by himself. No responsibilities. Tell me, why do you work so hard? Well, to tell you the truth, sir, because... Because I have a hope. An ideal, you might say. In a few years, I... I hope to retire. Retire, huh? Oh, I have it all planned, sir. I'm going back to England. I hope to raise horses, sir. Well, not, uh, not race horses. Just horses, sir. Do you care for horses, Mr. Stevenson? Well, I'm afraid I haven't thought very much about them. Oh, then you're missing a great deal. Well, that's my hope, sir. To live there quietly and raise horses. Why have you waited this long? Money? Money, of course. But someday I'll... Well, why wait until you're old? What good is a dream when you're too old to enjoy it? Oh, I've thought of that, Mr. Stevenson. I suppose the zest does come out of things with the encroachments of old age. Now, you're talking, Wally. My motto is, if you want something, get it now. It's, uh, it's the next turn to the right, Mr. Stevenson. Uh, Chestnut Street. You know, Wally, Wally, I've been thinking. There might be a way out. A way out? Yes. To have your little place in England. Everything you want. <laughs> Indeed, sir. And all you have to do is to make a little mistake every now and then. Mistake? In the laboratory. I've been checking on it, Wally. The way you're set up, no one would ever know. Mr. Stevenson, I... I'd better say goodnight, sir. Wait a minute. The differences in the amounts of those raw drugs you handle need be so slight that nobody but yourself would ever know. I... I don't understand, sir. Look what you've done for the company all these years. And what have you gotten out of it? Not a tenth of the salary you should be getting. No. No, please, Mr. Stevenson. Now, don't be silly. I've already talked it over with someone else. Talked it over with... With whom? A man named Murano. He can handle all the raw drugs that we can get. And then we split. You, Murano, and I. Mr. Stevenson... I just can't believe it. You're a young man, vice president of the company. A wonderful future ahead of you. Don't make me laugh. Yes, I'm young. Young enough not to waste my life in dreaming. There are things I want to do, big things, and the only way to do them... 
I'm sorry, Wally. I thought you were my kind of a person. I trusted you. But, but what if we were caught? Why should we be caught? We'll make our pile and stop before anyone even guesses what went on. Morano knows just what to do. Besides, for once, there's an advantage in being Cotterell's son-in-law. Yes. Yes, I... I see. I thought you would, Wally. Well, partner, we're in business. And so we started, Mrs. Stevenson, a systematic plan of robbing your father's company. By September of last year, I had banked the sum of $7,500. But then, I received a memorandum from the personnel office. Will you please stop your whining? Didn't you read the memo? You're not fired. They're simply transferring you to the New Jersey plant. But they must suspect. This is a warning. I'm sure of it. I'm through, Mr. Stevenson. Okay, you old fool. We've been stooges up till now. Morano's played us for suckers. This is our chance to get rid of them. That transfer of yours is just what I've been looking for. I, I don't understand. Look, I'll tell Morano you've been fired, that the deal's all washed up. Meanwhile, you're back there in New Jersey. We'll operate on our own and we'll split Morano's share between us. But, but I'm just a chemist, Mr. Stevenson. I don't know anything about disposing of drugs. But I do. I know all about it. Now listen. The Cotterill plant in New Jersey is in Bayonne. And just across the bay from Bayonne is Staten Island. I happen to know a little about Staten Island. About six weeks later, we began operations, Mrs. Stevenson, on Staten Island, New York. Our headquarters was an old abandoned house, 20 Dunstan Terrace. There, twice a week after work, I would come from your father's plant in Bayonne. And there, Mr. Stevenson would telephone me or mail me his instructions from Chicago. A little over three months ago, Mr. Stevenson arrived in New York. A few nights later, when I went to 20 Dunstan Terrace, I found that your husband was not alone. Come right in. We've been waiting for you. Wally, this is Morano. Morano? You didn't expect me, did you, Mr. Evans? Well, neither did Mr. Stevenson. But here I am. You see, I have ways of finding things out. For instance, ever since the two of you broke off our pleasant little association in Chicago... I find you've accumulated a rather large bank account. Am I right? What about it? I'm warning you right now, Morano. Don't you try any funny business. Relax, Mr. I'm warning you. I said relax. Sure, you're a big, strong guy, Mr. Stevenson, but mussing me up won't get you anywhere. You see, I merely represent an organization. But we had what you might call a board meeting, and the vote was seven to one against you. Now, that's pretty serious. That's like a death sentence. Well, cut it short, Morano. What do you want? Mr. Stevenson, please give them what they want. Mr. Morano, you can take everything I've got. Shut up. Now, if you were to turn back what you've accumulated, Mr. Stevenson, and pay us $200,000 for our injured feelings, I might get the board to reconsider their decision. You know as well as I do, I don't have that kind of money. But you have such wonderful connections. A millionaire father-in-law, a very rich wife. Yes, a lot of good that does. Why do you suppose I went into this racket? But I thought I read somewhere about your wife being sick. Very sick. What about her? Well, she has life insurance, hasn't she? Made out in your name. Now, I'm pretty sure the board will give you, say, 90 days to raise the money on something like that. Why 90 days? Isn't that what the doctor in Chicago said? She wouldn't get better? Yes, that's what he said, but... Well, what's that? Well, just a little IOU to make it legal, you see. Everything can be straightened out without any trouble, without any rough stuff. But suppose something happened, and my wife didn't. I mean, I mean, if she got better. I wouldn't worry about that, Mr. Stevens. You've got a doctor's word for it, haven't you? They know their business. So here, take the pen and sign the piece of paper. What I have just told you, Mr. Stevenson, took place three months ago. I need not describe Mr. Stevenson's distress when the IOU became due last Wednesday. As I understand it, Mr. Stevenson saw Mr. Milano but his request for an extension was refused. And now, inasmuch as I have already given you the final message, I believe the rest explains itself quite simply. Mr. Evans, where is my husband? Where is Mr. Stevenson now? I wish I knew. Perhaps if you tried the Bowery number... The Bowery number? What Bowery number? The one I gave you when I first started to talk. Mrs. Stevenson, I'm afraid I must ask you to check it all... I can't! I can't! I'll repeat it once more. Point one, the house at 20 Dunstan Terrace was burned down this afternoon. I did it. Point two... I escaped. Point three, Mr. Milano has been arrested, so it will not be necessary to raise the money. Point four, it was not Mr. Milano who told the police. Just give me the Bowery number, the one for my husband. Point five, I am at the Manhattan address now, but I'm leaving. And may be found at Bowery 2-1000. Bowery 2-1000. Yes, after midnight. Good night, Mrs. Stevenson. And thank you very much. 
Bowery, too. One thousand. Bowery, two, one thousand. Oh, Henry. Henry. Oh. Bowery, two, one thousand. Is this Bowery... Is Mr. Stevenson there? Mr. who? Stevenson. Mr. Henry Stevenson. I was told to call by a Mr. Evans. Just a minute. I'll see. Stevenson? Yes, yes, Stevenson. Hold on. Yes? No, he's not here, ma'am. Oh, well, Mr. Evans said he might be expected. Could I... Could I leave a message? Message? Now, look, lady, if this is your idea of a joke... Oh, please. Please help me. What number is this? What am I calling? Bowery 21000. The city morgue. Oh! 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 Operator. Operator. Please... Give me the police quickly. I will ring the police department. No, no, wait a minute. Give me the hospital. I can't be alone. It's 11 o'clock. Hurry, please. It's 11 o'clock. One moment, please. Operator, I can't hear you. Are you calling the hospital? Operator, operator. Bellevue. Is this a hospital? Yes. I, I want the nurse's registry. I want to hire a trained nurse immediately for the night. I am sorry, but this is a city it hospital. It doesn't matter. I've got to have a nurse. I understand that, madam. But... I'm sick and I'm all alone. All alone in this horrible empty house. I overheard a conversation. A telephone conversation about a murder. A murder to be committed at 11.15. I, I, I don't know what's happened to my husband. If something isn't done, I, I'm afraid I... What was that? What was what, madam? That... That clicked just now on my telephone. As though someone had lifted the hook off the extension downstairs. I did not hear it, madam. And if you were... Well, I did. There's someone in this house. There's someone downstairs. And they're listening to me now. Who is it? Who is down there? Hello? New Haven is calling Mrs. Henry Stevenson. Is she there? I I can't talk now. Call back later. I have a person-to-person call from Mr. Stevenson. Do you not wish to accept the call? Did you say Mr. Stevenson? Mr. Stevenson from New Haven? Do you wish to accept the call, madam? Oh, yes, yes. One moment, please. Here's your party, sir. Hello, darling? Henry! Henry, where are you? Oh, I'm on my way to Boston, dear. Stopping oh. off between trains in New Haven. Didn't you get my wire? Yes, yes, I got it. I was sorry I couldn't reach you by phone before I left. But of course, I knew you'd be all right. Well, I'm not all right. I'm... There, there's someone in this house, Henry. Right now, I, I'm sure of it. Oh, honey, how could there be? Don't tell me you're still alone. Well, of course I'm alone. Who else could be here? You promised to be home at six o'clock. Oh, I know, Leona, but I thought I explained it. I've right? been alone for hours. I've been afraid of every kind of horrible call. And Henry... Henry, I want you to call the police. Do you hear me? Tell them to come over at once. Now, honey, you know you're perfectly safe. The doors are all locked and there's a private patrolman. You're right in the heart of New York City and the phone's there at your bed. Henry! Henry, what do you know? What do you know about a man named Waldo Evans? Evans? Why? Why do you ask? I I had a long talk with him just a little while ago. About you. About me? What about me? Oh, he told me some terrible things. Some of it sounded insane, but some of it... Maybe it was true. You mustn't listen to every crackpot that calls you up, dear. Now, now just try to forget about it. He, he said you'd been stealing from dead company. Is that true, Henry? Leona, of course it's not true. Well, he, he left some kind of a message for you that the, the house on Staten Island had been burned down and that the police knew everything and that Morano had been arrested and that... Henry, are you still there? Yes, I'm here. They, they said you were a criminal, Henry, a desperate man. And heaven said... Evan said you wanted me to to die. Leona. And that money, Henry. That money those people wanted. Why didn't you ask me for it? Why, I'd have given it to you gladly if it would have saved your life. I, I, I'll give it to you now if it isn't too late. That's all right. Forget about it. I didn't mean to be so awful to you, Henry. I, I only did it because I loved you, and I, I thought you didn't love me, and that you'd go away and leave me. Leona. Yes? I want you to do something. Will you forgive me first, Henry, will you? I want you to try to get out of bed. Please, Henry, please. Leona, listen to me. Try I can't. to get out of bed. I can't get out of bed. You've got to. Walk over to the window and stop screaming, Leona. Scream out of the I, street. I can't move, Henry. I'm too frightened and I... Keep trying. Otherwise, you've only got three more minutes' time. Henry! Oh, don't talk anymore. Just get out of that bed. I confess everything, everything. I did steal from your father and I was so desperate that I even tried. Henry. I erased it. Henry, I can hear footsteps. Somebody's coming up the stairs. Get out of that bed. Walk, Leona, walk. No. No, I can't. Henry. Oh, Henry, save me. The train. I can hear the train. It's near the bridge. I... Please, Leona, wait for oh. them to get me. They'll know. They'll find me. 
Sorry. Wrong number. For a thrilling experience in the theater, our thanks go to this evening's stars, Barbara Stanwyck and Burt Lancaster. They're coming downstage now for a curtain call. You know, it's good to have you both back. And it's nice to be back. Bill says you've got them in bed with the audience, Barbara. In what way? Well, we keep getting letters asking why you haven't been here for so long. And we have to keep explaining that you've made one picture right after another with no time off in between. One thing is sure, Bill... I haven't forgotten the Lux Radio Theater or Lux Soap. It's my favorite complexion care and has been for years. And that's one of the nicest compliments Lux has ever received. Barbara, tell me if you can. <laughs> Isn't she wonderful? Sure, I sound like How Andy many... Devine. <laughs> she says she sounds like Andy Devine. <laughs> tell me, Barbara, how many pictures have you made that still aren't released? Four, Bert. And what's the first one we'll see? The Hal Wallace production, Thelma Jordan. Oh, yes, Wendell Corey's in that, too. You know, when you and Hal Wallace get together on a picture, we know it's going to be a hit. Bert, I hear you are off for New York in a few days. Yes, I've just finished my own Norma F.R. production of The Hawk and the Arrow at Warner Brothers. And now I'm going to New York to see a few shows and take a brief vacation. Well, your last vacation you spent out on the road with a circus as an acrobat. Nothing like that this time? Not unless you have to be an acrobat to get tickets to South Pacific. <laughs> Bill, tell me, what's next Monday's show? Next week, Bert, one of America's best-loved characters will return to this stage. The gentleman I'm talking about is Mr. Belvedere. And our play is the 20th Century Fox hit, Mr. Belvedere Goes to College. Naturally, we'll have the original Mr. Belvedere here to play the part, the amazing Clifton Webb. And besides Mr. Webb, we have two other stars, Colleen Gray and the popular Robert Stack. A great comedy and the return of Mr. Belvedere all on next Monday night. Everybody will love it, Bill. Good night. Good night. Good night, and thank you. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, there's a great deal of vague and sentimental talk about the American economic system. But here are some cold facts. Since 1910, we have increased the income of each household from $2,400 to about 4000 and the figures are in dollars of the same purchasing power. We've done it by increased production, and yet we work 18 hours less each week for this extra money. This is the miracle of America. <laughs> Lever Brothers Company, the makers of Lux Toilet Soap, join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday evening when the Lux Radio Theater presents Clifton Webb, Robert Stack, and Colleen Gray in Mr. Belvedere Goes to College. This is William Keeley saying good night to you from Hollywood. Our play was adapted by S.H. Barnett, and our music was directed by Louis Silver. Here's a fashion flash from Hollywood. Barbara Stanwyck has one of those smart, new, finely pleated nylon nighties that stays in pleat when you wash it. Of course, she insists on Lux Flakes care for it just as she does for all her lovely lingerie. One of her favorite shades is a pale green orchid. This spring, you'll be seeing more and more delicate and unusual colors in slips and nighties. So play safe. Wash them with gentle Lux Flakes. Tests prove that wrong washing soon fades colors, often tears delicate lace. Lux Flakes care keeps pretty slips and nighties new looking three times as long. Use Lux Flakes to give your nice washables that lovely Lux look. This is your announcer, John Milton Kennedy, reminding you to join us again next Monday night to hear the Lux Radio Theater presentation of Mr. Belvedere Goes to College, starring Clifton Webb, Colleen Gray, and Robert Stack. Stay tuned for My Friend Irma, which follows over these same stations.